On behalf of the Australian Society for Computers and the Law and the Australasian Higher Education Cybersecurity Service, I welcome you to this webinar on Who is Watching Cybersecurity and Australian Universities. First, we'd like to acknowledge the First Nations people of each of the lands on which we meet and their continuing connection to land, sea and community. For me, I acknowledge the Bedigal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Austrade estimates that by 2025, the tertiary education sector will generate $33 billion in revenue. The sector plays a vital role in the prosperity of our nation, leading research and bridging skills gaps, including in cybersecurity. But the sector is also at risk especially due to the digital the dis, um, sorry, disruption that affects all of us, especially in this modern learning environment and the ever increasing complexity of the legislative and economic environments in which universities are forced to operate. Universities provide a treasure trove of financial, student, industry and research data and contain critical systems and infrastructure. In a recent study by the Centre of Strategic and International Studies, they found that Australia was the world's sixth most targeted country. And not surprisingly, .edu.au was the domain topping the list. As for the cost of disruption, the Digital Trust Reports modelling suggests that four weeks of partial digital disruption to the Australian economy would displace up to 163,000 jobs and to the economic impact will be to the tune of $30 billion. So these are not small risks. Of course, they accelerated by an increased sophistication of attacks on, on key infrastructure, including our universities and AI uh, driven cyber warfare. There's much that can be said about this, and we're joined today by a fantastic and distinguished panel of experts who will talk us through the issues. Today's format is such, each panelist will be given 10 minutes to speak on the topic, followed by a group discussion moderated by Professor Richard Buckland. So Richard will perform two roles today. He's both a panelist and a moderator. We have allocated time for audience Q&A, so please be sure to use the Q&A function to submit your questions. Following Q&A, Greg Sawyer, the Director of Cybersecurity Program at Audit and AHEX, the Australian Higher Education Cybersecurity Service, will close the event for us today. And now, so as to not interrupt the flow later on today, I would like to quickly introduce our distinguished panel. First, Brian, uh, Professor Brian Schmidt. He is the Vice Chancellor and President of the Australian National University. In 2011, uh, Professor Schmidt was the winner of the Nobel Prize in Physics. He has served on a wide range of national and international committees and is a passionate about evidence-informed policy. He will share with us today details regarding the well-publicised cyber attack on, at the ANU. Next on our panel is Michelle Price. She is the CEO of the, cyber, the Australian Cybersecurity Growth Network, otherwise known as Ost Cyber. I can see you're zooming in on the faces there, Ashley. Um, <laughs> slightly intimidating, but lovely to see you there, Michelle, on the screen. Throughout her career, Michelle has led an impressive list of initiatives across government and industry, including for the Australian Government Department of the Prime Minister and Cabinet. She's passionate about cyber innovation and supporting the industry. Now, David, it's your turn to be zoomed on, in on um, David Wilde. David Wilde is the Chief Technology Officer at ARNet, Australia's academic and research network. The network connects more than 2 million end users, interconnecting many of Australia's institutions, including universities, the CSIRO, research institutes, uh, scientific instruments and archives. I think museums are also in the mix. David is a leader in computer networking and applications and has held leadership roles across sectors in Europe and Australia. And now to our Professor Richard Buckland, who will be both a presenter 
as well as a um, he, he is a UNSW professor in cybercrime, cyber war and cyber terror. He is the director of SecEDU um, Cybersecurity Education Network, a partnership between UNSW and the Commonwealth Bank. He is a multi award winning professor and serves on the governance and advisory boards of a number of industry and education institutions with qualifications in economics, science and a university medal in mathematics, physics, computing and economics. He has been awarded um, three, um, sorry, one of the first of, it's just so much to say here, Richard. Stop, stop, um, stop. stop. <laughs> okay. um, many of you would know every member on our panel and we are certainly very privileged um, to have such a wonderful and distinguished panel today. Um, Richard, you've asked me to stop, but that means it's time for you to start. So Richard, over to you now to, to moderate the panel and also to share your insights into cyber education. Thank you, Thank Richard. Thanks, Marina, and hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming and joining us. I think we're in for a treat today. What a great panel. I, I would be ashamed to have a longer introduction than a Nobel Prize winner, Marina. So um, <laughs> thank you for stopping. No problem, my pleasure. <laughs> um, thank you. So uh, just before we um, jump to our excellent panel and start picking their brains, uh, I just thought it'd be good to give a quick overview of the field and how important it is. I'm pretty sure everyone's starting to understand how important it is, but Anyway, let's just start by saying that probably there's three categories of things that are interesting in cybersecurity. One is the bad guys can access and look at information and learn things, so they access data. And that's probably the easiest from the bad guys point of view. The second one is the bad guys can disrupt things, can stop you from doing what you want to do, denial of service attacks and so forth. Um, and that's only slightly harder. In fact, sometimes even easier now, now that we're getting a bit better at number one. And the third thing is the bad guys can do stuff. So they can uh, cause a uranium separating centrifuge to burst into flames and burn down structures in Iran. They can uh, cause blackouts in the Ukraine. They can control traffic. They can direct planes. They can manipulate stock markets. They can change information, transfer funds, perhaps even change election outcomes, perhaps launch nuclear missiles. So doing things is, of course, uh, the in many ways, the scariest scenario. Um, but all are equally important in different ways. And today we're probably going to be focusing on the first one, which is accessing information, finding secrets, learning things. And the university sector is in a really interesting position here because we have lots of secrets that can be commercialized. The way our funding works is we sort of need to commercialize them. It's actually a, a serious loss to us if we can't. But also unis have a mission to disseminate knowledge and sort of how science and the other academic fields have advanced is by sharing and being open. So we have this tension between keeping secrets and wanting to disseminate. And I guess our problem is if the people are disseminating a bit more than we want and things we don't want and learning our stuff. So that's what we'll be talking about. Um, I just wanted to talk briefly about the question we're answering today, which is who is watching? Now, the panelists are going to perhaps be talking about who's watching us in terms of which, who are the bad guys and what they're watching. But I think it's interesting to notice who's watching cybersecurity. Everyone's watching cybersecurity. I think five or 10 years ago, um, I used to give um, submissions to parliamentary inquiries talking about the dangers of election interference. And by potentially by foreign governments. And I was laughed at a couple of times. I'm pretty sure that everyone in the room here who's been in cybersecurity for more than five years has themselves suddenly noticed there are terrible threats um, which need to be thought about and found it very hard to persuade people to pay attention to them because human nature being what it is with risks, we tend to be black or white, on or off. So either we're obsessed with them and put a lot of effort in or we ignore them completely. And of course, um, what we really need to know, the engineering thing, is to where in the middle of that spectrum to focus. And cyber has flipped from being something that no one really cared about to something that everyone cares about. So now everyone's looking, it's on the news, it's talked about all the time. It's great for the field. Um, I'm really pleased with that. Um, and then there's a, uh, of course, as with everything, there's a slight problem that comes with that, which is um, uh, with people being worried, there's a need to control. And with people being obsessed and going completely to one from zero, it's possible that we'll overreact, um, perhaps like the US did with their focus on smallpox, obsessive about smallpox, didn't care about influenza. Um, and really they needed to worry equally about both. So we are now in an interesting position where I guess governments have, um, when 
faced with risks tend to legislate because that's their power. Technologists, when faced with risks, tend to buy shiny machines and go ping and use technology. We all tend to do resort to what we know and what we're comfortable with. Um, I'm guessing this extra focus on cybersecurity is really good, but I hope some of the nuances in the discussion today might come from some overreaction, perhaps even. So that, that's the context of the whole field, um, but enough of my yak, and let's hear what the important people, including the man with the Nobel Prize, have to say. Um, Brian, would you like to um, uh, present your experience from the ANU and your thoughts? Sure. I mean, I think it's important for uh, me to just go right back. You know, I'm a, a technical researcher. Uh, my work is on thermonuclear detonations, but not on Earth, but in uh, in space. But it turns out the people who work on the ones on Earth and the ones in space are the same people in some cases, not particularly me. So I've been embedded in people who have had to worry about cyber since my first days as a researcher. And I guess Personally, um, in 19, I think 1990, a very high profile event happened when a student in Australia at RMIT basically took over the entire US supercomputer network to crack the password of one of my colleagues who had written a book about cybersecurity and stole his, stole his password. And it, knocked, it completely locked down the whole internet of the United States in 1990, my first year of graduate school. Uh, and at that point, I realized it was important because it personally affected me. And you know, I couldn't do any work for three or four days because, of course, we as researchers have been using the internet since before anyone else even knew the internet existed. It's one of the reasons uh, it existed. So uh, I remember after that, I went through and I got a password cracker. I was the systems administrator on the uh, on the uh, student's uh, workstation, Sun Micro, if you cared. And I went through and I realized that I could crack about 75% of the passwords in less than 10 seconds with a very old piece of code. So uh, I realized vulnerability right then. And so I've been always very aware since. Come to the ANU, uh, my first day at the office, I, I realized immediately we had some pretty serious systemic issues, but changing a university whose network has been glaciated since 1972, right? I mean, ANU has had some version of the internet in its first year and universities don't turn things off. It's just layered, you know, it's, it's, it's cyber archeology span in a university. And trying to get sense of that uh, is hard. And you're trying to go out and discover the new things of the world and so, you know, as a vice chancellor, I'm like, we really need to do something about this. It's not OK. Well, in 2018, uh, we realized uh, in a relatively minor uh, covered, but for me, pretty major covered incident that our network had been well and truly compromised. Uh, now, at that point, it turned out that people were just sort of using as a sand pit to go and I think train, quite frankly, their staff uh, because it's they don't appear to have stolen anything. But I had a good talking to by various people across the lake here in Canberra that I had to raise my game. And I said, OK, uh, I need some help. And we started a major program of really going through and figuring out how do we make ourselves safe in the modern era. And this was important because I immediately realized that it's not, you know, people are obsessed about our IP being stolen. I mean, ideally, most of our IP that is stolenable, we put into companies, so it's valuable that way. And the amount of stuff that we actually hold that's useful on campus is pretty small at any given time. But much more important are things like the, the actual ability of my staff to do the work they do. We do lots of stuff that is sensitive. And if I have students from you know, countries, do, I, do they, they have to feel safe that they can interact in an open and free way in my environment. I mean, I have women from the Middle East doing feminist issues and they need to be able to do that and not feel like their family's gonna get locked up. Clearly I have people from almost any country on planet Earth working on things. And so the entire integrity of my operation, people have to feel safe. And so in while we were doing a lot of work in 2018 and 2019, and we made ourselves much better, 
Uh, I brought in a CISO, a Chief Information Security Officer, something we haven't had before, you know, reports up to me. And I remember in May, he called me up on a Friday afternoon and said, Brian, I got some bad news for you. And I said, how bad? He says, I don't know, but we definitely have a reportable data breach. I can see that the data has left. Uh, and I said, well, how did you figure this out? And he said, uh, well, it's a long story and I won't go through all the long story because it was very convoluted. Uh, and we try and we we gave a very fulsome account and I'll talk about why I did that. Uh, but it, it, it essentially by building up our capability, we were suddenly able to detect things that quite frankly, we would have never been able to detect in the past. And we eventually, you know, when we, well, we immediately reported to, to, to ASD and to ASIO. Uh, and instead of being really angry at me, like they were the year before when we were truly run over and nothing was taken, uh, the reaction was quite different. They were like, woohoo, well done. And I'm like, what do you mean? It says, you're the first organization that's ever caught something this sophisticated. So they were really excited. And I said, well, are you going to tell the world on my behalf that, um, how good a job? And they said, oh no, we wouldn't possibly be able to do that. <laughs> so one of the, the problems, of course, is in making your place safe, you find things and there is no reward for, for finding things that other people are unable to find. The agencies appreciate what you're doing, but I would say the media just shoots you as a target. You know, you're just becoming the headlight. So uh, it's kind of a scary place where you, uh, you're, you have lots of friends, but they just can't say anything out in public. So one of the things that I wanted to do was to use this as a chance to talk about how complicated it is and to have a conversation with my staff in the world about what cyber really looks like if you get serious about it. Uh, and I also wanted to have a conversation because it's not just the integrity of my mission. If you let, you know, if it's if it's a state run actor, they, you know, they're, they're kind of nice inside your 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 domains they don't destroy things but if you get a bunch of criminals in there they hold you hostage and they literally destroy the joint so you know you really want to be uh able to to defend yourself against cyber criminals because I, i'd much rather have a state actor going through my files than a, a cyber criminal and, and i think that's what people don't realize until they've had their data destroyed or something so we went with a very fulsome description um, because I thought it was important and it's important to have a conversation, but it also demonstrated to my staff that, oh, actually this is hard and I understand maybe why we got run over uh, again. So I thought it was, uh, it was an important uh, conversation to have. We, <coughs> we continue to uh, invest and work on cyber but the mantra of cyber is not one of compliance and you can't do this, everything's verboten. Rather, it's about realizing uh, you, that you have vulnerabilities and, in, and to essentially make things easy to do well, rather than making doing well hard. And so it's what we're trying to do is to actually improve our systems and make life easier for our staff, while at the same time, making them cyber secure. So that is at the very fundamental of what we do. Uh, but along the way, you have to do things like understand the cyber environment you're in. And so we have put a huge amount of investment to look at that. And let me tell you, there's a lot of stuff going on underneath the bonnet of a university that you didn't know about. And, you know, it's like, what is this thing? And the answer is, oh, that was something set up in 1977 that's still plugged into the uh, into the into the wall and still doing things. Um, and so there are things like that. And then the other problem is, is you have a very created staff and students, right? And they're very good if you make things hard of bypassing things. And so I'll well, just use this virtual net that no one knows about and get straight into the system I need. Well, uh, guess what? That is, of course, exactly how our very sophisticated state actors decided to go into the center of the system as well. And it was uh, convenient for one of the parts of my university to bypass university regulation, but of course it opened us up. So having those conversations, being able to, to realize that this is a team sport, but that by doing things well, we can actually make things easier and better. Uh, I think has been a real eye-opener for people. 
Uh, it's still a journey for us, but it is, it's not optional. People need to realize that, you know, when some cyber criminal locks up your thesis of your student and they lose three years of work, uh, it suddenly becomes real, real. And, you know, you just literally destroyed three years of someone's life by not taking care of the detail in it. It's everyone matters uh, if you're going to stop that from happening. So uh, that's, a, I think, my life in a nutshell here. Thank you, Brian. That's that's fantastic. There's going to be so many questions for you. Um, and thank you too for finishing on that note for making it human. Um, because really that's, I think that's what drives most of us in the, the industry here. It's not a game. It's actually an abuse of trust and it's hurting humans. So thank you very much. Um, David, would you like to tell us about your experience? Sure, absolutely. Now I'm going to try to drive some slides here. Hopefully you're seeing slides come up. And I'll see if I can bring you back up so that I'm looking at you. Uh, so yeah, hi, my name is David Wild. I'm from RNET, Australia's Academic and Research Network. Um, something that jumps out at, at each of these conversations that we've been having is uh, is uh, how there wouldn't be cyber problems if we're all disconnected from the internet. So I thought I'd commemorate those good old days with this uh, this archaic t-shirt or shirt of mine. Um, however, uh, Arnet uh, connects all the universities to the internet. So in fact, our job is to, to cause all of this problem. So my apologies from the start. Um, many of you maybe don't know uh, much about Arnet. We try to keep ourselves as Australia's best kept secret. Um, we uh, owned by the 38 universities and the CSIRO, and we uh, connect all of them to each other and uh, off to the internet. And that goes back to 1989 when a group of universities teamed up to connect Australia to the internet with a, um, a screamingly fast 56k link via Hawaii to the USA. Um, we connect more than just universities, uh, galleries, libraries, archives, museums. Instruments, I guess, is a really big part of this. So things like the Square Kilometre Array, or radio telescopes or HPC facilities. Um, and um, because my job is CTO and T stands for technology, I'm going to inflict on you some uh, probably more information than you ever thought you'd need to, but it's it's pretty, I guess, relevant to, to where I'm going to go with these, with these remarks. So we run a network. We've got fibre in the ground all around Australia uh, and out to all of the university campuses is that we can reach, or certainly all the main ones and many of the regional ones too. And I guess the idea of this is that we provide unconstrained bandwidth as far as is possible to campuses, because that's that's really what enables research. Um, over the top of that, we run a number of services. So EduRome, for instance, that allows you to go from one campus to another, Cloud Store, Zoom, which we're not using today. So I'm, I'm discovering uh, MS Teams. So if, if I accidentally click the wrong thing, you'll have to bear with me. Um, but, uh, that's that's fine. We've we spent a long time building out that network, and um, and you'll see unusual places in that network that a commercial provider wouldn't go to. Narrabri Parks for the radio telescopes, Murchison for the SKA, and so on. Um, but research uh, and education are global, and so uh, we collaborate globally. And this is where you, you start to see the, the issues come up. Of course, it's the, the fantastic advantage of working in a, a globally connected environment, but also that uh, provides a way for the bad guys to get in. Um, and we collaborate closely. So Australia is, sorry, RNET is Australia's national r &E network. Um, every developed country has one. There are 120 odd of them out there and we collaborate closely together. And, and that's how really uh, the traffic to enable research gets carried. So you'll see CERN in um, uh, Europe, which hosts the Large Hadron Collider. Their data gets shipped out of there. Similarly, the SKA in South Africa and Western Australia um, and, and facilities all around the world. But uh, the key to this is that we collaborate as networks more than just at a, at a conference level or at a, uh, have great video calls. We actually physically interconnect with each other. So this is, this is really to give you a bit of in insight into how the, the attacks that we're talking about today actually happen. So, it's probably a bit hard to see, but the, the grey dotted lines around this diagram relate to the, the networks of those various other r &E networks. The coloured lines are physical infrastructure that we at INET have. So we have close to 300 gigabits per second of capacity to the west coast of the US, and we are part owner of the JGA cable to Guam and then onwards with capacity to Singapore, and again, part owner of a subsea cable um, Perth to Singapore, and then we have capacity on this little faint green line all the way to London. So, so the edge of the Arnet network owned by the universities is actually in London, 
and Singapore and Guam and the United States. And so we physically interconnect with other networks there, both the commercial internet, um, which is where most of the bad stuff happens, as well as the RNE networks, which is where most of the good stuff happens, if I can generalize somewhat there. Um, and so to give you a, a bit of insight into that, the, the, the Large Hadron Collider sitting on the border of France and Switzerland, for them to disseminate their in the order of 300 gigabits per second of traffic, of which somewhere between 10 and 50 gig has to make its way to Jeffrey Taylor and his physics team at the University of Melbourne. Um, it hops onto that RNE network. And so because we operate the network as a collaboration, we're able to actually create private circuits, private networks, uh, meaning that that traffic can actually be carried almost all the way uh, without touching the commercial internet. Uh, and in fact, almost unreachable reachable from the commercial internet. So that, that, that I guess that focus on owning our infrastructure is vital to this. Um, so, uh, so much of the network part, you know, experts in how the internet works. Um, the, the key part now, I guess, that I wanted to delve into a bit was, is where are we going to with cybersecurity? So Arnet, uh, since 89, has, has been progressively working with and for the sector on delivering that unconstrained bandwidth, trying to, I guess, reduce the tyranny of distance that Australia suffers from, trying to bring Australian institutions onto a level playing field. Um, and uh, as Professor Schmidt said, like for the for the last couple of years, and I think Richard, you said also that uh, the, the language and, and the awareness that it's not all about sharing collaboratively data and research, you now have to protect it also and, and ensure that it's it's being kept private, that it's uh, that our systems and our data and so on are not being, uh, I guess, compromised. Um, and the, the key part of this sentence here is, is the together part. Um, uh, Arnet is, yes, we happen to connect a number of the universities, but each individual university and a, a range of other players, all of us, uh, who consider ourselves to be the good guys, need to work together to, to make this work. We can't do it all together. Um, and so Anna is uh, working on a number of uh, initiatives to try to support that. Um, and, and I guess I just wanted to give a bit of insight into what we as a network provider see, um, which is quite different sometimes to a university's perspective. So we see a lot of DDoS attacks, denial of service attacks. That's uh, thousands or millions of, of PCs spread around the world, usually infected by a virus, being configured to send a lot of traffic at an institution or a server. Um, We've seen, I guess, a, a doubling in activity on that front in the last year and can only see that increasing. And so uh, one of the, the things that we try to do there as a network provider is uh, stop that traffic. A university can't do that because by the time it's got to the uni, it's too late. Uh, and universities are as, as well equipped as any. Uh, a school, for instance, or a, a museum struggles even more. So we, we're spending a bunch of time uh, on traffic analysis techniques and tools uh, to allow us to identify that and drop it as far upstream as possible before it even comes to Australia. Um, this, this, this kind of thing um, can come from a range of motivations. We've talked about state actors, we've talked about, well, potentially politically motivated vigilante groups who've decided they don't like an institution, potentially disgruntled students, um, or it could even be Richard Buckland's fine students uh, testing their elite hacking skills against uh, the, neck, the networks around them. Uh, and that was a joke, Richard. I'm sure they wouldn't do such a thing. Um, uh, the, that's the motivation. The means, however, is dead simple. Uh, you can sign up on the internet uh, from the website that we took this little screenshot said. It said, this is a quote, not ready for your online exam, no problem, stress test your university systems for free. So the means is easy. Uh, the motivation is varied. So uh, we endeavour to, to solve this kind of relatively simple problem. I guess a, a more complicated uh, endeavour is, is now trying to work and help with the universities on that, uh, the, the kind of stuff, I guess, the, that Brian was talking about before. How do, how do you see what's going on on your institution? And so Anna has been developing a, a security operations centre initially to be sure that we know what's going on on our network. Um, both our own systems and services and, and the, the infrastructure that's carrying university traffic. Um, and, and so to that end, we, we take all of the various logs, ingest them into a platform, uh, which can then apply static correlation techniques, uh, advanced machine learning based techniques, and identify when they're anomalies so that we ideally catch the bad guys uh, at, at any point along their, their, their hop, which comes from 
that, that initial attempt right through to exfiltration of data. Um, but uh, because we're doing it for ourselves, uh, we can see a, a clear need and have had a clear need expressed to us from various, I guess, CISOs and CIOs around the sector to say, look, can you do that for us as well? And so we're in the process of developing a, a service which will be a, a managed SOC service um, for the sector. Now, we recognise that not every university needs that. Some universities and, and Suthiga, uh, uh, Brian's university is doing a fantastic job, and but not every university is as well resourced or with the expertise or the, the resources, particularly in these difficult times, to do it themselves. Um, and so we're, we're hopeful that a number will come on board with us and we'll be able to facilitate that conversation between all the institutions uh, to, to share knowledge. Um, regardless of, of whether they happen to be using a service from us or not. Um, uh, the, the, the reason that, that we think that there's uh, an opportunity for, for us as a sector to aggregate this is the sheer volume of activity. This is a bit of a, a snapshot of what it looks like uh, to a university by one of these dashboards. To give you a sense of the volume of activity though, in the course of, so we've, we've got four universities onboarded at the moment and looking at further, uh, a medium-sized university sends something in the order of 1.6 billion events per day, so uh, firewall logs or network connections or PC logins. Um, there's a lot of stuff going on in a university, um, and uh, as I say, uh, a big university may be double that. They may be resourced to be able to do that. Many small universities just don't have the resourcing to be able to, to provide this service, so we're so really keen to, to endeavour to work with the whole sector and uplift that. Um, but if I go back to that international slide, the key to this is that it has to be collaborative. And so we're, um, uh, I guess, as, as the international arm of, of the higher ed sector, we're working with our, our other RNE networks in, in Britain, in the United States, in Canada, um, but more locally also, the key to success is for this to happen collaboratively. So working with OSCERT on sharing threat intelligence and the government, so the ACSC and JCSC. Um, OSCYBER, we're extremely uh, thankful to, to Michelle and team for, for funding part of our activities and, uh, and Greg from uh, AHEX is here as well, uh, the, the partnership across the sector. And, and, and so for us to to be part of and to facilitate and to contribute to a sector-wide conversation to me is the way to succeed. And that's right down to working with uh, VU on a, on a graduate program or with Richard and, and his, his team of cybersecurity students collaboratively to make sure that, that we're giving them as a, as a country the, the skills that they need to, to help us as a sector. That's it from me. Thank you, David. Um, that's wonderful. And it's the same arc that Brian took, which is starting with technology and finishing with people, cooperation and the sort of human dimension. Um, this is a really nice theme. Thank you very much. Michelle, we're itching to hear about all the things that you've been doing and the great work that you've um, sort of inspired at Cyber. Thanks, Richard. Um, fantastic to be here with everyone. What an amazing lineup of people. And uh, as a demonstration, actually, of just how collaborative this environment is, um, I like to think that Cyber acts as a bit of glue and uh, I know everyone on this screen, uh, and not before today, not everybody did know each other, but of course, um, I'll take credit through Marina <laughs> for bringing everyone together. Um, so Cyber, for those that don't know, we are an industry growth center. We are, of course, the growth center focused on cybersecurity. And with cybersecurity being the horizontal enabler for all other industries uh, in the economy, uh, of course, our growth centre is very, very important in creating industry and creating knowledge around what this endeavour of cybersecurity is. Uh, so a couple of things, I guess, to kick off. Firstly, um, it is in Brian's nature to kind of, you know, be quite, uh, I guess, focused on the facts and the data. Uh, he completely undersold uh, the importance of the work that uh, him and his team did uh, earlier this year to release a very, very, very important report around what happened uh, at the ANU. Uh, the reason why that um, report is so important, and if you haven't seen it, I really, really encourage you to have a read of it. Um, it the endeavour of cybersecurity is so multifaceted and uh, multi-layered. Uh, that we do have uh, within the biz of cybersecurity, a lot of challenges around how to best describe what does happen 
how to fix it, how to build this challenge, this elusive thing called resilience uh, in cyberspace. Um, but actually, of course, our world now is cyber physical. Um, because if we do talk about openly how we go about defending against malicious activity, how we protect um, our people and keep our information and data safe, we can reveal methods that can be used against us by malicious actors. And this is why it's so hard for intelligence agencies in particular to talk publicly about cybersecurity and the methodologies around how we uh, push back against malicious activity because we could reveal uh, how we go about at the pointy end of the equation uh, pushing back. So for Brian and his team to release a discussion paper and a report around how they've gone about um, helping themselves as well as helping others uh, to understand what happened at the ANU is critically important and not just for universities, for the entire economy. So that's a really, really important step forward in the maturity of, um, of our country around the endeavour of cybersecurity. So thank you, Brian. It was really, really important. And I think that um, for the university environment, uh, of course, everyone involved in the university environment knows this, but really we take our university system in Australia for granted because it is world class. We know that where it's, it's one of our major exports, all of those things that we know. But when it comes to the cyber physical world that we live in, universities create knowledge, uh, share knowledge, uh, grow knowledge, and they are indeed, in fact, the banks of our economy. So if banks hold money, and they enable us to rapidly transfer money, um, <clears throat> pardon me, here as well as overseas, and trade in the value of that money. That's absolutely what universities do in the business of knowledge. It is that critical to the progression of our economy, but also the progression of our community, that we must invest in the endeavour of cybersecurity to protect and preserve and advance uh, that very, very important role that universities have. And I'm intensely proud of the work that we do with Arnet uh, to be able to progress the help and collaboration uh, within this uh, university system, both here and across the world, to be able to continue to protect that in such a way that we are not hampering uh, what we celebrate as the knowledge creation process, but the innovation that happens around the research process and also the teaching process. Uh, and of course, you know, I proudly, proudly say that I'm, uh, you know, a former employee of the ANU uh, and know that uh, many, many other universities around the country um, sort of struggle to have the voice to sort of say that we are damn good at this stuff. It is, of course, why universities are such a high target for malicious activity. And so because we have such a reliance on universities in that knowledge creation and sharing and sustainment and growth and innovation and all of those things, uh, it necessarily means that we have to take a community type approach into how we not only protect that, but how we advance that. Uh, so the relationship between governments, uh, industry, and also the research community in protecting universities from malicious cyber activity at the same time as encouraging that open and free use of knowledge uh, is really, really important. And so having a national cybersecurity strategy that acknowledges the role of universities as critical infrastructure for our economy and for our community is very important. But it's also really important that we value what each university contributes to that conversation, the lens that they apply. And so the ANU being a research-based university like the University of Melbourne and UNSW and all of those kinds of different conceptions of a teaching university versus a research-based university, there's lots, there's so much richness in that. Uh, and the collaboration that we've had over the years with uh, Sec Edu at UNSW with Richard and his teams have been fantastic in being able to demonstrate that applied nature of how you can have students be inspired to take up the mission to push back against malicious activity at the same time as demonstrating to any Australian, as well as researchers at the same time, that there is so much opportunity that comes from us being able to trust the information and the infrastructure that we're using to go about our day-to-day -day jobs. And so the last point I'll kind of uh, leave us on is around the role of the law. Uh, and universities are a really interesting place for us to test the boundaries of the law. 
And we really are still trying to settle on what law in cyberspace and even more so what the law does around this cyber physical world we now find ourselves in. What all of that means? What is the left and right of arc when you necessarily have to involve research, whether that research is in a formal way on a university campus or through cyberspace through university collaborations or what happens between universities and industry or what happens in industry and what happens in government? There is necessarily a grey zone in all of that where we need to understand the methodologies and the motivations of malicious attackers. We need to understand how they use our tools against us and how cyber technologies and digital technologies have multi uses that for every one good use of a digital technology has a thousand negative uses as well. Universities necessarily need to be engaged in and encourage the use of dark side type behaviours uh, and malicious activities within a safe environment that we can test out and learn how to do better at this. That's incredibly challenging for a CISO or a CTO or a CIO within a university environment that's also trying to protect the infrastructure that's providing that very instance of us to test the grey zone. So our legal system has a really, really important role to play in all of this. And absolutely, the elephant in that room is that our legal system is not keeping up. And the research that we can do around the legal system as it applies to the cyber physical world is critically important in this equation as well. And so what all of that comes back to is collaboration. None of us can answer any of these questions, especially when we don't know what the questions are to ask if we're not working together. And so the reflection of having the different kinds of um, organisations and people on this panel today, uh, and Cordit does some amazing work in being the glue at the behind the scenes, another under-celebrated organisation in this picture to pull together and have a sense of collaboration and a sense of mission to all of the IT related people involved in universities to advance that conversation means that we have to remember to include a conversation about the law and what regulations are needed to encourage us to learn and to do better. Because those malicious actors out there, as Brian said, the criminals, gosh, they love to cause damage. And nation state actors, when they come at us, they might not cause the same kind of damage as what criminals can, but they're in it for the long game. And we know that the malicious actors that come after university um, campuses, infrastructure, people, everything in between, they are here for decades and decades to undermine, chip away at the trust that we have in the information that we're using to go about our daily lives. So having front of mind the law and what kinds of regulations enable us to do better are super, super important. And as I said to somebody else this morning on a different webinar, uh, you know, the one thing that the machines have not been able to replicate yet, and I don't think they'll be able to replicate for a really, really long time, is human intuition. Nothing beats it. Our intuition to know whether or not something isn't quite right or whether or not there is a prize that is worth going after is priceless. <laughs> and so to be able to harness that across the networks that we have in the university system facilitated by Arnett and Cordit. This is a universally unique part of our armory that we can use to push back against malicious actors in cyberspace that wish to do us harm. Thanks, Richard. Thanks, Michelle. That was a very generous and thoughtful um, sort of summary, like 100, 100 foot up view of, of the whole thing. And I really like this this notion of humans in the loop, the importance of keeping humans in the loop, your intuition point. In the aviation industry, this is debated a lot in, in aircraft safety. To what extent should systems be fully automated? And to what extent do we always need to keep humans in the loop? And currently the consensus is we can't do better than keeping humans in the loop, flawed as we are. Um, it's really lovely to hear you say that so clearly, clearly, more clearly than I just did. Um, Look, I'm in a slightly awkward position now because uh, I'm now a panelist and I was a moderator. Isn't that weird? Um, the, anyone that knows a little bit about information security has probably heard of the American model, the Bell, the Padua information security model. Military user for controlling flows of information and ensuring only the right people get to read and write various pieces of information. Um, 
And I remember the first formal proof I ever saw that a system was fully secure used the Bell Lepadua model. Uh, and it was a proof inside the Bell Lepadua model that a, a, a particular system was quite safe and no one would ever invalidly be able to access or change information. And interestingly enough, I think it was a student that then uh, cracked the system. So we had on the one hand uh, proof that it couldn't be cracked. And on the other hand, we had someone cracking the system. It turns out when everyone looked in it, into it really closely that the um, the problem was one of the assumptions of the proof. Um, it assumed something called tranquility implicitly. No one, no one noticed the assumption was there. It was just in there and in, in the way the proof was executed. And the, and the tranquility assumption is essentially that no one changes roles. And the way the system was attacked was they had a person who had one role and then they had another role. And by the combination of those two roles, they were able to bypass the model. And you probably have heard of Nick Leeson, the rogue trader who brought Bering's bank down uh, in a terrible way. Same thing, he could carry out trades and then he could settle the trades. He had one hat and another hat. That's how you sort of break things. Uh, and I guess that's what I'm doing now. So I'm sorry about that. We we talked before about this notion to a man or to a person with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Um, and I guess we can think a lot about regulation. We can think a lot about all sorts of things. Um, but at the end of the day, I think the real problem in cybersecurity is not that we have a missile gap, but that we have a personnel gap. It's a human shortage. We've far outpaced the number of professionals we have to actually maintain and look after the systems. And I'm sure David would tell you that. I'm sure Brian would tell you that if, in trying to hire people. Um, this, the, and it's sort of acknowledged well, why there's a massive shortage. My students at the moment, uh, it's really annoying. They go out and get these fantastic jobs straight away. Uh, it's actually quite tempting for them to leave uni early. There's just a worldwide shortage and it's projected to last forever. I thought I'd just briefly talk a little bit about that shortage and the role of universities in training people. Bear with me because it is relevant. Um, the, I sort of think of it as being like forests. So if you want to have a lovely hardwood floor, you can go into a forest and chop down a hardwood tree, an old growth forest, a tree that's been growing there forever. Um, but after a while, when you've lost all the trees, say the cedars in Australia, the beautiful cedar trees, then what do you do? They're all gone. That's sort of what happened as cyber started to take off as um, a threat to business. The businesses slowly, slowly started to realize they needed to employ cyber people and they went out and employed the previous the, the previous generation of hackers, essentially, the people that were the bad guys or in their mum's basement. Um, they got quite good jobs uh, looking after cyber. And I think of them as like old growth forests. They just sort of taught themselves. Most actually didn't go to uni. I did a bit of um, counting on that once and very and some even dropped out of high school, but they were fantastic. And business took them, put them in suits, paid them lots of money. And now they're spread out across the country doing fantastic things. But just like old growth trees, there weren't many of them. Um, they'd sort of brought themselves up, taught themselves in quite tough environments to l learn this stuff. And once they were gone, what do we do? Well, we needed plantations. The number of the shortage of people is much like the shortage of engineers soon after the steam engine was invented. Um, there just weren't enough people around the world to drive the Industrial Revolution to know, to know how to even use a steam engine. Britain kept, of course, a tight monopoly on all the engineers it had, uh, and it taught them very slowly using an apprenticeship system that didn't scale. And it was a long time before Europe eventually broke free and started training people at scale with polytechnics to become engineers. That's sort of where we are now. So we've used up the old growth forest. We're trying to create plantations. We're trying to get universities and other training organizations to train people at scale to fill this massive and seemingly unfillable shortage in at least the medium term. But the problem is the plantation wood is never as good as the old growth forest wood. And that's sort of what I wanted to talk about. So why? What is it that makes those people so good that taught themselves and makes the students that we train at uni sometimes not, not as good as that? How can that be? So I think part of the challenge is at uni, we have to do things at scale and we have big systems in place and we have tight budgets and so on and so on. So it's very good to follow processes and the sorts of students we need, I think, the sorts of great professionals that David would like to employ are rascals, are people that question everything, who are curious, who are driven by passion, who never ever give up, who are lateral thinkers, and, and really who are troublemakers. And they are a bit of a pain to train and teach, and most of them ended up dropping out of uni in, in the old growth for us days. So our challenge in the university sector is how can we train people to be rascals? How can we train people to have these skills? And I, I guess as academics, when we talk about it, they really are the skills we want our students to have anyway, all our students. It's just it's 
quite convenient to treat students like um, pigeons in a Skinner box and train them by giving them marks like breadcrumbs or seeds to sort of please us and do the things we want. And if I train a student to please me in cybersecurity, I'm actually not training a really good cybersecurity student. Um, the old uh, a tyrant of uh, Syracuse, Dionysus I, the first, uh, he, he was a, a, a horrible man, but he also fancied himself as a poet. And there's a story, I don't know if it's true or not, that another poet came to his court once, um, and made fun of his poetry and was sent to um, sent to the quarries to live uh, to a prison sentence of hard labor. Uh, and then his friends interceded for him overnight and pled and pled and pled. And the next day the tyrant said, okay, you can come back. And they brought him back and put him in the court and then recited some more poetry to him. And then said, what do you think? And, um, and the poet said, turned to the guards and said, take me back to the quarry. And, and really that's the sort of student I want. That sort of brutal, honest questioning, not putting up with rubbish, not accepting things sort of students, exactly what we need in cybersecurity. It's hard to train. We've got lots of ways of trying to train them. And we're experimenting with all sorts of things and had some success as I'm sure all unis have. Um, but Michelle raised the problem that universities like me, have two roles. We're both the bank and we're training the bank robbers or the defenders. And this is a real dilemma. It's the whole tranquility thing. How can we on one hand have all sorts of systems, government laws and regulations controlling and protecting the universities and tying things down and at the same time give our students the skills they need to combat the bad guys? The, the bad guys don't need to ask for permission. They have those skills. Uh, it's the good guys really that have been constrained by that. That's our challenge. Um, and so uh, I really have no more to say than that, other than uh, I hope that sort of comes out in the discussion too. And we think universities, it's an awkward place. The word universe is in there in a way, isn't it? And I, I sort of think that's what we are. We generate knowledge, we train students, we're the conscience of society, we try and be open, but we try and be commercial. We're trying to be so many things with such a little budget. Uh, it is a really tight juggling act. So um, I think that constrains the particularly unusual scenario we face as universities in the cyber world. Um, so that's that's my sort of summary. Now I'll switch back to, oh, Richard, thank you very much. That was not quite as good as the other three, but I really liked you talking. Thank you very much. Now, if we can go to questions, we've had so many good questions from everyone coming in. So enough of my yakking, let's hear. The, uh, first of all, we got one from Cordit, which is my favorite question. Um, I'll read it out because it's a bit long. And this is for you, Brian, and also for David. The higher education sector is facing significant changes in regulatory standards and frameworks many directly in relation to who is watching. In a short period of time, it has been or will be subjected to the University Foreign Interference Task Force, the Defence Industry Security Program, enhancing the cyber securities of Australian universities, protecting critical infrastructure and systems of national significance, uh, including potential regulation there, and the national cybersecurity standards. How can the sector respond to this volume of changes in times of reduced resources and budgets while continuing to protect the institutions for the watchers, and I'll add a bit, and continuing to do our job in terms of research and looking after the students and producing the next generation of professionals? Well, I guess I would say we can't unless all those things are harmonized. So uh, about a year and a bit ago, I came out very strongly, and I would say not with huge amounts of support from my fellow vice chancellor to say, we need to have this University Foreign Interference Task Force just to get out and do it in a way that makes sense within academia, because what will happen is we will be regulated in a way that makes no sense. So we did it, and can I say, um, the various agencies have been really, really good. And it took us about three months to realize that we were cats and dogs, but we could still coexist, and, and it was great. Um, and, and I do think um, there's a lot of ownership within both the universities and the agencies now around that. The other things, uh, I, I think there's a will within the agencies to harmonize those, so uh, what we're doing in the universities makes sense and, and sort of naturally falls out about our approach to, to the UFIT, the University of Foreign Interference. The announcement earlier this week is a little concerning because it was not harmonized and I don't quite know where it's going. I mean, there's some almost uh, antithetical things in it right now. And, uh, but that being said, you know, we'll have a chance to have conversations. I think we have a lot of people in the right places 
who are prepared to have have, have a discussion about it. So the, the challenge we have is I, I know I, I've been in this now and I have a very good idea what good looks like because I've been working hard on it for the last year and a half and I will be doing everything I can to make sure I continue to do good in this time when we have this economic shockwave. And, and the answer is it's core business. You know, I have to keep my buildings. Uh, I actually have to do cyber. You know, I have to have the fire extinguishers serviced. So it's it's sort of a cost I, I have to bear and it's not optional anymore. And if you think it's optional, then you don't understand the threat in the same way. No one thinks you can't have your fire systems doing right. Well, cyber is the same way. So we're there, but here, I mean, I have the advantage of being in Canberra and I will be having conversations with the people around these legislation and make sure they don't undermine, you know, the university system and the democracy. But, you know, the, the whole notion that one of the things that's in the legislation is we can only work with people who are have the same autonomy as us and we're going to limit your autonomy and that, that's like a, a it's a it's a inner loop that i don't know where it goes but it's not it's not internally consistent and i don't think it's about what universities do and i, I just want to give people an indication you know universities uh and university of sydney astronomer opened up the relationship with china in the 60s by doing things he didn't ask for permission the point is he didn't have to ask permission he did it and that was the thing that allowed us under you know subsequent uh you know 10 years later to really open up i have relationships with the central party school in china now i have i have no illusions uh that that really goes to the core of the chinese communist party but that's a good thing i'm supposed to be having conversations right and do do we want to stop that from happening uh it doesn't uh, so we need to understand that we are a foundational part of our democracy and we we need to make sure we're not over regulated because if we are then we start looking like non-democracies that we're supposedly securitizing ourselves against so I, I think we have a little bit of conversations that are going to go forward in the next couple of weeks and months i'm i'm so pleased to hear you say that and you should know that everyone in this room and and many people outside it are just cheering for you and i'm so glad you're in canberra and you have the ear of people please never stop doing what you're doing it is so important um the the question was about how to deal with um you know all these extra demands with reduced resources and i guess your answer was well, you just have to. I mean, that's just business. You have that's the world of business. And really, the key part of your answer was the main thing is to notice this is core business now. So, along with all the other core business things you have to do with reduced resources, this is just another one. Uh, but did I get the sense just when you started to answer, you also had a bit of an answer in terms of using killing two birds with one stone, like a little tip for how to deal with reduced resources? Well, there is no magic pudding except for a, I know I need to improve my digital environment here. And what is at the core of cybersecurity? Authentication. What is the core of seamless systems? Authentication. If you get your authentication environment, so it's just second nature, then I can seamlessly add data and, and bring things together. So I can kill, I can actually make myself better and more secure, but it requires investment. What I cannot do is to say this is, uh, this is too hard right now. I have to make decisions about what I do and don't do, but I'm afraid being a completely insecure cyber place is not in any more than a fire, uh, you know, a place where fires occur regularly. Yeah. Yeah. It's just not on the cards anymore. Yeah, thank you, thank you. David, what about you? Do you have any, you've got oversight of the whole sector. What, have you seen how people are dealing with this at other universities? I definitely wouldn't say we have oversight of the whole sector by any Oh, means. overview on <laughs> we, we, we get some kind of visibility, I suppose, at a very yeah. technical level. Um, and in fact, to be honest, we, as a, and it's a licensed telecommunications carrier, we get hit by other bits of legislation also around the Telco Act and, uh, and privacy and so on that are even, you know, we, we the, the reasons the universities created a network was to be able to look after that so they don't have to, I think, of a, 
if I summarize very kind of probably overly too much. I would say I really liked what Brian was saying. And one bit that I'd, I'd pull out of that, I guess, is um, the, the universities and research education and uh, institutions in general always love doing stuff themselves. And one thing that I really liked about the, the task force and so on is that it's, it's moving away from that. It's saying, look, 80% of what we need is common to all of us. Um, how about we just share our scarce resources or our scant resources uh, and, and we can worry about that last 20% individually and that, that way we're, we're proactively, I guess, setting the agenda as well as, as sharing those resources so that we, we're getting most of the job done. It's it's certainly something, you know, Arnett is 130 people or thereabouts running a network the size of Telstra's. Um, we're used to, to deal, dealing with very small numbers of people, um, but I realised like every university is the same, the cybersecurity teams, uh, the legal teams are, are all tiny with respect to the uh, the entire institution. So we, we just can't afford to be, afford to be uh, reinventing the wheel every single one of us, regardless of how different a university is between you know, the, the range of the 38 and the CSIRO. That's a nice answer too. So um, maybe maybe together we're stronger than any of us individually. Maybe Yeah, maybe that, that yeah, yeah, I see. That's really good. Also, I like this notion of us all being starved a bit. I think there is research that shows if you are constantly starved, you live a little bit longer. Is that right? I don't know if your life's as good. Um, Michelle, we have a good question for you. What are your thoughts on the, because we've had quite a few legislative changes and regulation changes over the last couple of years, and what do you think their impact on industry has been, and what do you think still needs to happen? Such a good question. Uh, so we have been quite vocal about uh, legislation, particularly the encryption legislation, otherwise known as TOLA. Uh, so most would be aware of that. Uh, and we uh, absolutely proudly uh, put on the bulletproof vest uh, for most of industry uh, in moving forward and saying, you know, no. <laughs> uh, that piece of legislation uh, doesn't cut it. Uh, and so I think that uh, the TOLA piece is representative, actually, of, um, you know, sort of the, the lack of nuance across the legislative landscape. Now, I, I, there are always exceptions to the rule. Um, you know, I am someone who firmly does believe in the rule of law, and I believe that legislation, but also probably more importantly, regulation does have its place. But what we're faced with now is um, in such an interconnected, uh, it's almost, it's hyper-connected um, how, you know, the, all of the sort of different infrastructures that we're working with, uh, universities included, um, means that uh, the legislative process uh, that we have in Australia, whether it's at the federal level or it's at the state territory level, uh, it's too siloed. Legislation is being developed uh, as a focal point in and of itself. And I know that the Attorney General's departments across the country are trying to get better at this. Uh, it's very hard. Um, but when we're trying to use legislation and regulation really to shape behaviour, mm -hmm. uh, whether that's behaviour of humans or machines um, or both, uh, you know, I was sort of talking a lot last year about this, um, this kind of challenge where we actually do have a train smash now of legislation. Yeah. And while we don't have a lot of specific legislation impacting cybersecurity, again, because cybersecurity is that enabler, I would argue that every piece of legislation impacts cybersecurity and vice versa. And so we actually see unintended consequences happening all over the place. Uh, and so there have been dramatic impacts for industry. It's just that a lot of industry hasn't recognised that some of those pain points that we're experiencing, what's holding us back a lot of the time, why we don't have some of those freedoms that we used to have, is because that uh, that sort of, I guess, the gravity, the size of the change that has happened has actually happened incrementally. It's that death by a thousand cuts kind of thing. Uh, and where we need to be looking at things um, in a much more integrated, uh, integrated way. Uh, and so, you know, sort of, I argue all the time behind the scenes as well as in front of the camera, so to speak, with uh, with governments. So we have to be really careful now uh, that we are, in an unintended way, working at cross purposes around what kinds of behaviours we need and want to see within our economy, within our society, because we are in a cyber physical world. I keep saying it because it is true, and so the impacts have actually been quite significant. I think, though, there's some glimmers of hope. And the two examples that I would use is that as much as when I was inside the machine, so I spent a bit of time working in federal government, 
um, I was actually working quite actively against uh, the notifiable data breach scheme legislation when it was going through, not because I don't believe in notifiable um, sort of structures and frameworks. I think notifying about uh, vulnerabilities and disclosing about breaches and compromises is a really important part of the conversation, as uh, you know, Brian and the ANU have done through their report. I think it's the way that we do it is really important. And what I was arguing in that equation was that a threshold of $3 million is not fit for purpose anymore because you can have a sole trader now in cyberspace who turns over more than $3 million a year. And so the regime that we are placing upon that sole trader is too burdensome. Even a large company uh, that has all of the resources at its disposal um, relative to a sole trader can't report within 30 days. They often don't know the average um, time from compromise to being aware of a compromise occurring in Australia is 87 days. So how does the legislation then say 30 days? We break the law straight away. So that's the kind of detail that I think we need to go to. But notifiable data breach scheme, there's still a long way to go to on that, but that's a positive step forward in my view. And I also think that um, the quiet, but quite deliberate step forward, steps forward that we're seeing around procurement and the importance of having Australian sovereign capability within um, the landscape, very, very important for cyber and cyberspace. Uh, there's some quiet movements afoot there, but of course, one of the biggest changes that we're going to see over the next 12 months is the critical infrastructure legislation. We've got to be careful. We've got to be careful. Is it going to impact on TOLA? Is it going to impact on the Telco Act? Is it going to impact on the Privacy Act? Yes, to everything and more. We've got to be careful. Wow. You, you know, when you were talking about the Notifiable Data Breach Act and you said you were working against it, I was my world was crashing around me. <laughs> uh, but, but then when you explained it, I think that's... You're right. Everything has to be more nuanced. And I guess if attorney generals... I've met people that work drafting legislation, they're really nice and they really think they're doing the right thing and they briefly learn a little bit about a subject domain and then pass laws and then move on to, to other areas and we who work in that domain. I remember, well, anyway, so I think that's there needs to be a more nuanced thing. So maybe here's a question to everyone. Um, um, how can we, how can we have a dialogue to make sure the changes that happen are good. So Toller is a brilliant example. It's you can see it had all it was had all these good thoughts and intentions behind it. All sorts of great motherhood things you couldn't argue against. But the actual effect of the legislation was horrendous, um, and it was sort of predictably horrendous for the people on the inside. And it seems to me with COVID, what we're seeing is wonderfully most governments in Australia are listening to experts. It's absolutely wonderful. So how can we somehow, how can we make that also, I'd love, I don't know if this is a politicking question, politicking question and that's you to Michelle, or this is a, a sort of an influence question and, and, and being a representative of a big body and that, that's to you, Brian, or, or maybe it's just being a technical expert and so it's to you, David, but how can we make sure we're in the conversation how can we make sure not stupid things happen? How can we push back when the crazy things do happen? It's, you know, there's that that crazy lady that's in the news at the moment. Maybe she's not crazy, but the one she's calling herself a bit crazy. The one that was arrested in her pajamas for um, saying something on social media. You know, saying something, not doing something, saying something. And that's the fear I have when I teach um, some parts of cryptography. Um, I don't want to be arrested in front of my children wearing my pajamas, but under the legislation, it's arguable that I, I could be. Um, so, you know, that's the crazy world we're in. I don't know how to change that. I don't even know who to speak to. No one asked me before they did it. I don't know who they asked before they did it. So what, what, what I'll stop talking. Do people have thoughts about how we can have influence for good in the future raft of legislation that's bound to be just around the corner after this current huge raft that's happening now? Who would you like to go first, Richard? Oh yeah, that's a tricky one, isn't it? What about um, paper, scissors, rock? How about we start with Brian, and then we go David, then we go Michelle? Yeah, I mean, it's it's not hopeless because uh, we do have the opportunity to have conversations with the people who are drafting. There's a whole way of making sure that we put responses into um, you know the the legislation. There's always a, a place where you can put 
put your responses in, then at some point you need to, when it's serious, you know, the, the, the challenge we need to have as a sector is some dynamic range so that we, you know, we always complain about blah, 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 but sometimes it's, it's mildly annoying, but quite frankly, not very consequential. And then you have things which are really consequential. And, you know, I'm looking at this new foreign interference legislation as going, wow, that is consequential if we get it wrong. Uh, another one related but a little different is the ACCC legislation, meaning to do something sensible, but in the process is, I think, undermining the whole notion of how the World Wide Web works and uh, to pay for news. And I want I want news to get money and have good news, but I don't want to break the Internet <laughs> to in the process of doing it. So good intentions. Um, the uh, anyway, the so there are needs to be a trusting, a more trusting relationship with us and the Commonwealth. Now, Michelle is in the middle of my attempts of doing that, right? We seconded her when she was at PMNC, and she sort of knows both where's now. Um, and so we need to get a bunch more people like Michelle who have sat in both bits and can be interlocutors and be able to say, hey, Houston, you have a real problem here. And then instead of them saying, I'll piss off because you guys are just a bunch of whingers, they go, oh, when Michelle says we have a problem, we should probably listen. So I have been really focusing here, and this is more my job as the National University than anyone else. I need to create the conduit between us, uh, us being the the, the uh, research community, and the the legislators, so that we can take all this knowledge and we can kind of get it in there, but. It requires nuance, and that nuance is really saying, well, that's a political decision and not very smart, but we can live with it, as opposed to you are going to break the system here. So so that's my approach, but it takes time. Uh, and can I say COVID-19 has been great. We've been able finally to realize that if you follow our advice, people don't die, and that happens on a 10-day period, so it really gets their attention. And they've seen that, Donald Trump and Boris Johnson have not listened to their experts and tens of thousands of people have died. So it's a good starting point for getting our attention, but easily lost in yeah. the course of the next election, for example. Yeah, thank you. That's a good point. I guess hopefully with global warming too, might might even have a more general uh, uh, raising the voice of science. 30, well, it's a 30 to 50 year bit, but you know, the the bushfires, of course, got a lot of people's attention. It was kind of hard to ignore the bushfires this year. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. What about you, David? What do you think? How can we agitate, for, or not agitate, how can we effectively bring about change? I think um, uh, a key aspect of this is, I think it's building on some of what Michelle and Brian have said, is that there are, there are multiple uh, uh, voices really so you know, if, if I'm inside the ASD then I'm going to be pretty motivated towards one kind of legislation if I'm a business leader I'll be motivated towards another the higher education sector uh, even represents multiple like the teaching and learning is almost quite different to the research but we need to have a voice at that table so the, the more we're able to engage uh, not just I guess with the legislators but with the the others who are presenting a voice there so engaging with the ASD or potentially ASIO or you know the the intelligent side of the government to say look uh, I realize you have certain motivations look here the universities we uh, this is what we're trying to do uh, and and my impression is that there's a lot of that going on more so I think than, than there ever used to be and I, and I think that leads to really good outcomes uh, my impression also is that those those bits of the government are, are really keen to work with the higher education sector to hear uh, what the requirements are and the needs are, and 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 so it's it's really a, a reaching out. Like uh, yeah, we're lucky to have people like like Michelle and like Brian and, and so on to, to be doing that reaching out, um, because without that uh, we don't get a voice at all. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and it's so so interesting, isn't it? When I went to uni, I learned about abstract algebra and binary numbers and all sorts of things that I could learn by myself looking inside my head or scratching on the on the sand on a beach and I learned computing algorithms and I, what I didn't learn was how to communicate and bring about change and I suspect the many of the experts in our industry are the same though probably if you're cyber in a business you've had to bring about change because you need to get resourcing to damn well carry things out but 
I think part of this solution, and Michelle, I, I'm, I'm about to come to you. I'm just musing over what David said. Part of it is I feel a duty as an educator when I train my students now that they're not just technical experts, that they're change makers and that they're articulate and that they can bring about change. I hope we've got champions like Michelle and like Brian, and we're lucky to have you guys, but there's a small number of you and what if you get hit by a bus or and, the, and your replacement isn't isn't it you know i i to see safety in numbers i want to have the smaller players having a voice i want to have an army of voice out there i want the media to be better educated i want the populace to be better educated so you know there's just a groundswell if you look at how this is something for those of you not in new south wales check out the news school captains in new south wales got the government to change their mind about one of their covered policies uh, you know, no one's been able to do it with border closures, masks on bus or anything like that. But they got together and effectively got the government to say you can have school formals in term four. And how they did it was a masterful piece of change management and communication. I, I, I almost want my students to study that as an example of how they should bring about change. Please, that's homework for everyone if you're not in New South Wales. But, but Michelle, what do you think? You're an insider. You know more than anyone what government and policymakers are like. What can we do to get their ear and, and to have a voice? It's a great question and I think um, I'll lead with the controversial statement that I think that uh, over time the uh, leeching of uh, or bleeding of um, people who understand all sides of the equation um, have left government. I'm one of them. Yeah. I went to government uh, having already uh, spent 15 years in industry mm -hmm. uh, and then spent almost 15 years in government and then um, spent a very comparatively short period of time in academia, but it was such a rich time uh, before now being at Ostcyber. Um, you know, having people that have all of that mix of different experiences and really what it is is contextual experience uh, to be able to, um, it's contextual experience actually with the, the hunger for knowledge uh, you know, everywhere I've been, I have always sought to understand uh, what is going on. So I do have a lot of knowledge around how the system works um, from within inside government, from within inside industry, and also from within inside academia. But we are rare. <laughs> there's very few of us. And there's actually even few of us in cyber security. Uh, so I think that then the flip side of that is that because government has lost so many people over the years that can be circumspect and can uh, be... Um, in listen mode and can feel empowered and confident in putting their hands up and saying this is a topic we don't know enough about. Uh, it means that government is learning again. So my empathy for government is that for all of the colleagues that I still have that I worked with when I was in government, they are in struggle town, but it is really, really hard for them to, as a culture, the culture of government is, um, it works against you to put your hand up, especially in national security to put your hand up and say, I don't know. Mm. Uh, so that's where the empathy extends to, but it's also where it stops for me. Uh, you know, government does need to trust industry and academia more. And so in helping government to understand the technicalities of the topics that are hugely complex, hugely complex, um, I expect in return by us helping them to understand the complexities uh, that they'll listen. And there are some areas of what we do in cybersecurity where government is not listening, but there are other areas where they are. So it is that we're in this kind of, uh, I guess, lumpy period at the moment. I think we've been going through it for the past sort of four or five years. Um, and it really does, uh, of course, be impacted by who's at the top and all of that kind of stuff. It necessarily always will. We're in a Westminster system uh, and, of course, proudly so. But... Uh, you know, I think that then there will be an evening out. There'll be a balancing that will happen. Uh, and I think the one thing in all of that is that the reason why at the end of the day, a voice like mine can be so powerful is because of the empathy that comes from all, knowing where people are coming from when they do stand up with a very, very frustrated voice uh, and say, uh, you know, I'm frustrated instead of sort of saying, hey, did you know that what you just put down on paper and you want to put through Parliament will break something? <laughs> you know, so I think that 
Um, that piece about communication, Richard, that you referred to is, is really, really important. And then what stands behind that is that contextual experience to understand. And absolutely, I want to be one of thousands of people that have that contextual experience. And to Brian's point, it takes time, but we can share those experiences to kind of accelerate the number of people uh, that do have the ability to be able to traverse those different contexts. Uh, and, you know, for, for anyone in the audience that um, is, is teaching within the university environment, do what Richard does, encourage your students to jump onto social media, get them to be following people like Brian and me. We've got voices and we use them all the time. Uh, clearly, we are people that love to talk, but we talk about meaningful things. Uh, so you can be learning on the fly by following people like us on social media, that's Twitter and LinkedIn. As I'm not a big person on Facebook, but I'm being forced to at some point, I'll be told, of, you know, as CEO of us cyber, I've got to go to Facebook. Um, but you know, that's how students can be observing and absorbing um, how to dance that delicate, nuanced line of being constructive uh, and being heard to be able to try and advance the conversation. Government's in this just as much as we are, and government, um, you know, needs to learn as much as what we're learning. Uh, they just often aren't very good at being able to say, hey, we need your help. Uh, and, you know, that's where we do see things fall down. Uh, and then, of course, there's the political pressures of trying to push things through very, very quickly at times, which is what happened with TOLA. Um, but when you've got eyes and ears like Offcyber, which, you know, is an independent organisation, therefore trusted by both sides and all sides around that, um, we can accelerate these conversations in a more sophisticated way. Thanks, Michelle. And gee, it's great being on a panel with influencers and people who have insight to bring about change. The audience, though, is rightly rebelling against my asking a personal question that's gone on for so long, and they've been asking so many good questions and we've been ignoring them. I'm very sorry about that. I guess the audience is worrying how, wondering how they can influence us. Uh, and <laughs> it's the same question. One super quick one, and then I'll go to the one from Ivano because I love that question so much. Um, but a super quick one, and maybe I'll just answer it rather than throwing it to anyone, but jump in, David, if you want to add something. Why is edu.au one of the most vulnerable? Uh, is it easier, more valuable, or less risk of retaliation? So why why is education so vulnerable? It's always been so. William Gibson wrote about it in the early days of the Neuromancer books. Um, uh, my friends or, or people that I know that are um, uh, hackers of various sorts say the easiest way of cleaning your trail is to pass through an edu on the way. You go through a chain of people go through an edu and they'll, as soon as the agency investigating tracks it back to an edu, they'll just give up and stop tracing the track further back because it's just anyone could have come from anywhere and done that. Edus are so diverse, they're not well resourced, they're largely open, people are trying to do innovative things, there are a room full of cats with everyone trying to mandate and run their own systems. They used to have rogue access points everywhere before People have invented the phrase rogue access points. They'd already were jumping in on that vulnerability that they like managing their own things. They don't like being controlled. We like our students having access. We mix everyone together because our infrastructure is small. So often on the same wires, if you saw the um, the tour into the ASD that someone did recently, into the deep dark vaults of Mike Burgess's room, um, you could see they had different cables for different services. Well, we don't often do that. It's all the same cables got everything on it. Maybe we use, um, you know, virtual switching and things at the, the, at the level layer two to try and separate but you know everything's mixed together so um and then we're slow to react and we're under resourced and it's hard to employ good people and the people you get go and everyone's overloaded and yeah, it's just a nightmare of a place and we have to provide connectivity and we've got fat pipes so if you can get into a uni you've got fat pipes to go around the world and do things so it's just attractive for so many reasons i'm sure there's many more i can see nods um maybe throw more in the comments if you've got more why we're just such a perfect place to be attacked it's really like has anyone seen that old gary larson comic uh where the two deer are standing by and one has a like a target on his chest and the other one goes bum of a birthmark, Frank. We've got the bummer of a birthmark being a uni. Uh, but the, the, the question though um, that Ivana asked right at the beginning um, is, this is for you, David, but if you can try and give a short answer, though, it's, it's my favourite question, so I can slip one more in and then not be lynched at the end that we did listen to the, the audience a little bit. Um, the report that you produced, or the ANU produced, describing, or in conjunction with others, uh, the, describing the breach is quite exceptional. And here, here, my students and I agree completely, and everyone I know that's looked at it feels the same. It's almost a world first in higher education. Congratulations on this. My question is, beside regulations, what were the drivers that pushed you to crack the ice and share details about the attack? What made you go public because everyone's looking at cyber now, you helped. And as far as I know, though you said you were criticized, I think of it as an exemplar on how to manage a data breach. 
I've never heard anyone say a new data breach in a negative way. Your name atto attached to that, not like the Sony data breaches. It, it reflects on credit on you. So you made the right call, but it must have been scary. Why did you do it? Uh, so I, presumably to me, not to David. Uh, oh, sorry, did I say da Sorry, David, sorry. I just like seeing his shirt. So, I mean, it, so when we had to announce that, uh, we got a lot of, my, my staff were mad at me. You know, Jesus, Brian, you made us do all this stuff and you still fell over the first bit. So from my perspective, I'm a kind of an innovative type of guy, you know, and I thought we need to go full on transparency. And I, I really do believe in what I describe as, uh, you know, uh, brutal transparency as a mode. And if you walk, look at how I do at ANU, I'm pretty brutally transparent uh, about things. I went out when we had our uh, current issues with finances, I went through and showed the balance sheet to the to the dollar as best as I know. And, and so that brutal transparency is something I have always used throughout my career and it gives people trust in you. Now it's not, people are so used to spinning things. And you know, when I came as vice chancellor, I said, I don't want any spin. I don't want any spin at all. Tell people what's really going on and then they might actually believe you. So, so that's why we did it. And we did it because it's how I've done my entire life. And you know, I think people realize I'm not a normal vice chancellor. I was a professor like you, and I suddenly ran the university. That's a very different way to get into that job. And so I didn't get schooled in the way to manage, but I also maybe didn't get some of the bad habits of managing. So I did it because I thought it would be effective. And, uh, but I will say until I did it, uh, people were unhappy with me and were wondering, you know, why I was their vice chancellor. Why don't they get someone who's good? But so you have to have that confidence of doing the right thing. You will eventually triumph. But that takes confidence. And most of us don't have that confidence. The one thing that a Nobel Prize gives you is lots of confidence. And you figure oh, I'll be all right in the end. The worst they could do is fire me and I'll go have a more fun job at the end. So that's the benefit. I that's actually an even better answer than I expected because I'm taking something for that in my own education, which is I have to give my students confidence. It's no use just giving them the skills to communicate. They have to have a strong moral and academic and ethical compass so they know, no, this is how scholars behave. This is the right behavior. Millennia have taught us this works. So that's fantastic. And the other thing I'm taking away is I need to have some Nobel Prize winners amongst my students to make them more effective. So thank you for those two thoughts. I'll, I'll work on them in that order. Um, uh, super quick questions. Uh, here's one from Barry that looks like it's come from my mum. You must know the answer to this, Barry. Richard, how do you feel about experts who claim that defenders don't need to understand attacks? <laughs> Everyone knows what we all think of that. Of course, you need to understand attacks. It's not sufficient. It's not sufficient. I mean, you can understand attacks and still be a hopeless defender, but how can you defend and not understand the, atta the attacker mindset? It's, um, you know, you are just tricking yourself as a defender. If It's like doing something without listening. You, you need to listen. You need to know what you're up against. It's not enough, but yeah, 100%. So we need to teach the students attack. I guess that's where you're coming from, Barry. And that's my scare part, because if I teach my students attack with a strong ethical core, none of my students, I mean, David, you joked before, but none of my students would do that, I, I think. We are so, we create a culture and a community of trust and ethical behavior and being professional. That's from the very first course that's built into them and led by example and the tutors are selected properly and their industry role models I bring in all echo that same behavior. And I think you'll find most cybersecurity professionals are like that. They might not have exactly the same set of ethical standards that um, you know, a normal Australian would have, but the standards they have, they hold to deeply and sincerely and are the most amongst the most ethical people I know. So I think that is beholden upon all people educating those people to, 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 to make sure when they go forth, their ethical strength, they want to be right and they want to do the right thing to make sure that's aligned with you know, society values and things. So absolutely, 100%. Thank you, Barry. That is an excellent question. And I think we've got, we can squeeze, Marina, can I squeeze one more in or are we out? I'll take that for a yes. The last question, uh, someone asked, I can't find it, AI. To what extent is AI going to affect the landscape? David, this is for you, but you've got to be quick because as soon as Marina finds out how to unmute, we'll have to stop. <laughs> uh, well, I guess as with every question about AI, that depends on what you mean by AI. Um, at its very simplest, um, machine learning, which clearly is not you know, what we're thinking about in terms of 
Terminator style AI. We're using it already. That's part of our, yeah, our, our platform. And I know a number of universities are using that already. So very specific task oriented machine learning is, um, is key to not having to employ 100 SOC analysts and to be able to, to have just a handful of them. Um, so it's, yeah, it's clearly already happening as to, as to where that goes. Yeah, that's a much bigger, broader question. Thank you, David, and thanks for being so terse. So yeah, it's a tool, like all tools, they can be used for good or bad. Uh, defenders use them and attackers use them, and it's just a tool. Uh, but it is a tool that does give you enormous power. It's like a, a warmer up for, for hurling a spear. It does magnify the power of individuals so much. Now, in summary for the whole session, we've been privileged to have with us three Australians, not overseas people, who are making a difference and who are champions for improving cybersecurity and the way they're championing it is by openness and discussion and by empowering the profession and by modeling good values and by while accepting regulation has to exist by pushing back a bit to make sure it's sensible regulation um, they are effective change makers i hope my students are also effective change makers like them i thank you all for coming and for your honest and careful answers and i thank the audience for all their questions and i'm sorry i didn't pass them all on i got excited with my own question please forgive me and marina thank you for organizing this event can i throw to you to just wrap up and thank everyone uh thank you richard delighted um but i'll actually throw across to to greg um, co-sponsor oh, of the Rick. event. No, no, no problem. Uh, your, your photos were switched a moment ago, so it's it's nice to have Greg back on screen. Um, and I, I'll now put myself on mute. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. I, I echo fully Richard's comments. Such a fantastic panel, and I've been enjoyed every moment of being here today. So, on behalf of the Australian Society of Computers and Law, the Australian Higher Education Cybersecurity Service and everyone connected today. I really want to extend a warm thank you to our esteemed panel. It's just been fantastic. Thank you to Professor Richard Buckland, Professor Brian Smith, Michelle Price and Dave Wall. Thanks also to Marina and Ashley and all those behind the scenes who pulled this together. It's been so good. So in just closing off to everyone, please stay safe and stay well. Thank you. <laughs>